Today's episode, as always, is being sponsored by ironsmusic.com. For music educators on the go, this is the band director's bistro. Hi, I'm Mark. And I'm John. And we'd like to welcome you to the Band Director's Bistro. In this episode of the Band Director's Bistro, it's going to be all about the virtual band room and beyond. While we're getting your favorite table ready, John is going to tell you what we have on the menu for you today. Oh yeah, today's episode, very relevant subject, obviously, in our current time. But what a menu we got. Today's appetizer, Thrilla Manila Clams. Mark and I are going to talk about a very unique story. And even though, I say unique because our eras in in marching in the vanguard were 20 years apart, but this particular story is something we did together at the same time, in the same year, for the vanguard which you're going to find out how did we do that today's main course bits and bites and we are going to get into a bit about what we can do in today's virtual band room for us band directors i mean our job has always been about working with our students right in front of us and creating wonderful music and cherishing and enriching the community but it's kind of difficult right now because we don't have those people in front of us. So what are we going to do? We got some ideas for you. Finally, for dessert, iconic ice cream. And Mark and I are going to talk about our icons, our high school band directors, and how they influenced us. It's going to be interesting. Stick around. Great menu today. You're going to love it. Ah, it looks like your table's ready, right this way. This is one of my favorite tables, by the way. I know we have, I think every table's got its own charm and dignity, but this particular one we're sitting down today, I don't know, I just love this locale in the bistro. Just kind of, you feel all the different energies kind of wafting right through you. Yes, I feel like it's perfectly situated, can see all the action. Thrilla Manila Clams. Well, th- we named this Thrilla is because in 2000, uh, I was a member of the Santa Clara Vanguard's individual and ensemble, mixed ensemble. I actually was the leader of the ensemble, put the whole thing together, and we performed Michael Jackson's Thriller. And Mr. Mr. John Steinwinder, who's rocking out there, uh, arranged said thriller for myself and my compadres, and we actually won I&E Mixed Ensemble first place. So we were champions that year for individual and ensemble. And we just thought we'd talk a little bit about the story because it's a... It's kind of an interesting story. Um, I want to really quick, if I can, kind of uh, kind of enlighten the audience out there as to what I&E is, because I know it's, we know about it. Those of us who've done drum corps pretty much know about it, but a lot of people out there might not know. Real quickly, you all know DCI out there, okay? And the top 12 drum corps and all that fun stuff. DCI also has something called individual and ensembles, I and E designed for individual competition or small group competition. This kind of levels the playing field because you can have a great trumpet player coming out of a division, an open class core, but actually be at the level of some of the top trumpet players in the big boy cores. This is that person's chance to kind of go in there and be one-on-one, face-to-face, level and equal. And that's happened a lot of times over the years where you have people from the smaller groups actually win some of the individual categories. So... Anyways, Mixed Ensemble is one of those unique things that uh, DCI has created where it's a mix of musician and percussion. And uh, you can have rules at that time allowed for a maximum of 15 people. 
Now, as far as when you first contacted me, it was on the road. You guys were already on the road, probably up in East Coast, near New York, somewhere, a little bit before that. Middle of the summer, when you guys finally decided you were going to do it. And you should talk about how that happened. How did you decide about that? Well, in 1999, I had wanted to be in the mixed ensemble, but I was not, I didn't make it in. I was like... Out of 15, the tried out, or you know, out of the 15 spots, I was the 16th man. So I didn't make it in 1999, and I was super bummed because they were doing a really cool funk piece that year. And I thought, and they had won in 1998. Um, so I had wanted to be a part of it. And so 2000 rolled around, and I strolled up to the person who I thought was running it, and they said, "No, I'm not. I'm not running it. No one's running it this year." So at that point, I just took the reins and I said, well, I'm going to run it. And there you go. And then I was in the mixed ensemble and I was already at this point a a four year vet. So no big deal calling the shots. Um, And yeah, I think we were just listening to the radio one night or listening to the CDs, uh, somebody's personal collection in the bus on on the road one night and Thriller came on. And I thought to myself, man, that would be a perfect I&E song. And I was lucky enough to have a cell phone back in those days, and I managed to get a hold of you. And it was tough to get a hold of you because you were teaching, I believe it was West Coast Sound, the drum and bugle corps from Southern California. And you guys were from San Diego. You were traveling to finals that year. Was that the first time the corps was traveling to finals, West Coast? Second year. We did it in 1999 as well. We had a very small core in 99 and did surprisingly well in Division Three, And so because of that success, the core grew in uh, in 2000, a bigger core. Still Division Three, but right at the top end, like 60 members. And uh, yeah, we were heading out to DCI in 2000 as well. We weren't on the road yet. I was at home, but I was very busy doing my normal client load of high school marching bands. And I was trying to get as much done as I could before I went on the road. So, yeah, I was a little tough to get a hold of. But I do remember getting your call, and I do remember picking up the phone or calling you back, and and we talked. Yeah, we talked. I had this idea for doing Thriller, and you said no problem. And I had it timed out. I think you had about seven days to write it because we needed, I think, a seven-day lead time for you to get it in the mail to make sure that it would make <laughs> the mail <laughs> to make sure that it would make the New York mail stop. I laugh about that now because if we were doing this today, I would simply send you PDFs and you'd just download it on your tablet where whenever you had a Wi Fi connection wherever you were. It would be that simple. <laughs> and that's so today that seems so commonplace and it is. But then email was just getting started. The internet had only been around five years. Cell phones, there was no digital cell phone, just beginning digital cell phones. It was analog for the most part. And yeah, we had to time it so I could send it off to you in time so it got to your mail stop in New York, as I remember. And so I had to get it done two days before that to get it into priority mail so it got out there within two days. So I had about a week to write it. And then I remember when we got it, I'm opening up this big, beautiful envelope and you were you know it was like you you had sent it to a band director i think you included a uh either a cd recording or a tape recording it might have been a, it might have been a cassette tape um cassette tape and you had sent the score and parts but i'm remembering now john you forgot to send i think it was the baritone two or the mellophone two part there was I, you're right. I do remember that. that I left you, something out. Just... Like, and I'm looking at the score, and I'm saying, John, I'm seeing the score, and you said, you know, what are you doing tomorrow? Or basically, you know, because I had a free day, and I remember going to a Kinkos in New York City. That's right. And you faxed me the two parts that we needed. And I remember looking at all those phone parts. Number, and those, you were at, and then I had to yeah, fax it those to you. parts yeah. were not readable. <laughs> fax machine technology still not very good. Um, yeah, I think we ended up just faking it until we made it. But or 
or cut copy or hand copy it out of the score. You know? Yeah, we did something like that because I remember those fax machine parts didn't look that great. But yeah, so all right, fast forward a little bit. So we have the music and we're rehearsing late one night after lights out, and I think this is either you know it's probably while we're in the upper northeast. And I remember the staff was getting back from one of their late night staff meetings. And I'm sure they were having fun at some restaurant, one or another. And they were they were listening to us play. And I'll never forget, one of the Color Guard staff members starts dancing. And I mean, not just dancing, like doing the thriller dance verbatim. And this guy ends up, he knows every single move. And so we looked at each other and he's like, oh yeah, we're going to do this. And so next night we got to rehearse again, but this time there was, I think we had about 15 color guard uh, folks, about 10 girls and five guys. And we worked out this whole routine where we were all zombies and one girl would be planted into the audience and she'd be like a normal audience member and then halfway through she'd get pulled out, get bitten in the, into the neck and then she'd do the dance with all the rest of the zombies perfectly and uh, it was great. And so it just kind of snowballed into this giant production and it was going to be awesome, John, because I knew that, you know, because you were taking West Coast Sound again to finals that you would be able to watch this amazing I E performance and of course you got to see it right i wah, couldn't wah. wait to see it oh yeah yeah you <laughs> you kind of prefaced that womp womp no i didn't see it and it was a darn shame and i and i can't be mad at anybody about it it was just one of those last minute situations that you just simply couldn't avoid all right, and and to kind of make a short story long, uh, excuse me, I'll just, a long story short. <laughs> <laughs> I've already done that. Um, re- real yeah, exactly. No, real quickly, what had happened is that morning, the morning of I and E, which is in the middle of DCI week, it was on a Wednesday, and finals is three or four days later. So on that Wednesday morning, I'm getting ready to go. The core had set it up. West Coast Sound had set it up where one bus was going to take a load of, of members to I and E, and I was going to be on that bus. The other bus was going to take a, mem- a group of m- members on a tour of Washington, D.C. for some of its highlights and iconic you know, uh, m- monuments and things. And it was all set up, and then at the last minute, the person who was going to, the adult or a staff member who was going to do that tour, couldn't do it for some reason. I don't remember why. So the core director had to come to me, and I was the assistant core director, and basically said, look, I need somebody to do that tour, and you're the only person we have now that's been in Washington, D.C. before and knows the, and knows the, knows the place. So I had to hop on that bus and become a tour guide. And, I, yeah, it was tough. I mean, part of me just didn't want to do that. Part of me just wanted to go see I&E. But I also knew that if I didn't do that, that those members who were looking forward to seeing Washington, D.C., a lot of them probably would never have the chance to come back again. So that might be their only opportunity in their life. And I couldn't take that away from them. So I played tour guide. And I was a darn good tour guide, too, I must admit. But all during that time, I'm thinking, man, I should be at i e So that's why I missed it. And then I had already arranged to fly out the following morning after our prelim performance. I had to get back and finish up marching band riding. So I was already packing clothes and getting ready that evening when you guys did your second performance. And I didn't realize that. I was already getting ready to head out of there, and I was packing and had to catch taxi like at 5 in the morning to get to the airport. So I missed both your performances. Well, they were pretty cool. Um, we we dressed up like zombies, and we put blood, fake blood, all over ourselves. And we had planned on crawling into whatever performance space that we were going to be performing in because in the previous two years... Because we assumed it was going to be indoor. Yeah, 1998, 99, both these venues were inside. So when we got to College Park, Maryland in 2000, 
we were quite shocked to learn that the INE venue was a f- high school football stadium outside. <laughs> and what we thought was going to be kind of a, you know, short little zombie walk into the performance area ended up being like this five minute long <laughs> zombie walk where we came in, you know, in character basically all the way from the truck and it was uh it took us a while to get there because we went nice and slow dragging ourselves and and yeah and it was great we had about 30 performers that day which uh <laughs> which i believe uh influenced dci to change the rules the next year because you know you definitely changed the rules because of your interpretation of the rules and it was completely legal dci had to change the wording the following year from musicians to performers which which would now include any dancing or visual element by your guard dci had not taken into account dancers into a mixed ensemble so we just sort of added them to the 15 uh so we had 15 plus 15 and i remember talking to the DCI official and he said you know how many members do you have in your ensemble and I looked at him and I was like well 30 and he just kind of shook his head he said well I can only give you these 15 medals and I can only give you these 15 jackets because that's all we have for the for the mixed ensemble and so I said no problem not a big deal and I remember I ended up donating my donating well i gave my jacket to one of the performers in the color guard julie uh she did great and she was a close friend and i ended up giving my medal who did i give my medal to oh that's right i gave my medal to you john which i still have proudly displayed here in china along with a lovely picture that you all took the entire group signed it the whole thing scv 2000 champions blah 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 I have that picture as well with the medal. Great, great memento. Very cherished memento. Might be some people out there wanting to now check this out on YouTube. And I will just tell you, people, it's not out there. Don't even bother looking. But I do know one person. There's somebody who won't put it up on YouTube. That's right. So, Mr. Troy Campbell, we need your help. talking to you, Troy. We know your dad was there. He He was basically there the whole time when i say that and we I know mean, your, I your know entire your dad five years he films everything <laughs> so we want to see that tape man thriller in manila clams there's the story come on that so, changed yeah, history this is a fun dude. story we, that, fun that story. deserves to be up there yeah but i don't have any mementos from it i don't have a medal or anything all i have is, yes, the, is the memory i have the memory and that is the most important one you were there you lived it I'm sure soon, once Troy hears this, he'll he'll have to dig it up. Come on, Troy. Overwhelming. Come on, Troy. I demand. know you, buddy. I've known you for a long time. More than I, I've known you longer than Mark's known you, Troy. Our fans are demanding it, Troy. Let's go. Let's go. We want to see this. <laughs> Actually, By the way, you know Troy, what? Troy, send a comment in, man. Let us know how you're doing, buddy. It's probably better in my head than it than it isn't on any tape. You that, might be uh, surprised. Mr. Campbell you might was be recording. Surprised. I don't know. It was a great arrangement, I'll tell you that. I do appreciate that, John. Well, Ooh, look what's only here. Goes so far. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, right. it's time for the main course. I'm getting hungry. For some main course. We got a little bit of this, a little bit of that. We got some bits and bites. Kind of like the digital version of dim sum, you know, where they roll the tray by and you grab a piece of this and grab a piece of that. We're kind of doing the same thing, but in a virtual form. That's right. That's right. We know that for the foreseeable future, there's going to be a lot of questions about what are we doing, how are we going to do it, and how long is it going to last? And John and I... We can't answer a lot of those questions. But what we can do is 
reflect a little bit on what we've seen in terms of some really awesome things that are happening in the music education community and you know have a little conversation about some of the stuff that's uh, going on in the virtual world I know it's tough to keep your students engaged online believe me both John and I are both teaching online right now actually I just finished up I'm now on summer break but uh, after teaching over a semester online just like the rest of you we know what you're going through so John you have taught some lessons online privately with your base students what are some of the things that you would recommend to a director when you're taking on a virtual lesson? Well, the first thing I would recommend is don't be scared of it because it's surprisingly very close to doing it face-to-face. As far as the things you're going to say, the commentary you might make, is what you're going to hear even through your phone or through your computer screen is going to be the same thing you would hear if the person was sitting next to you in 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 a classroom. With that in mind, there are some differences, obviously. You have to make sure you're always facing the screen. When you're face-to-face with somebody, you can can talk to somebody without having to turn to them direct, and they're still going to hear you. A little bit different when you're facing a computer screen or a camera, so you have to make sure you're facing the screen. That's a, a basic skill. And just a pro tip on the facing the screen is to try to look directly into the camera. That's going to create just that extra level of connection. I know it's very tempting to look at yourself or to look at the student the whole time, but especially when you're talking to the student, try to look right into that little circle. It's going to go a long way. Other thing I would recommend if at any point your your computer screen, if it might become visible, if you're showing somebody something, maybe I don't know how if you have that kind of technology, but if you do, make sure that you have any of your personal, private, social applications that you might use, have them closed. Because if anybody can see a screenshot of your screen, you don't want them seeing whether you've got Facebook open or any other social type of uh, platforms you might be in, involved with. That's pr- as part of your private life. Keep it private. I would recommend that. And the final thing I would recommend, it has nothing to do with what you're doing on screen, Oh, and what, well, okay, let's back up. Yes, one other thing. Be cognizant of your background, all right? Make sure that what's behind you, because that's what people are going to see a lot of times is your face and whatever is in the background of your shot. Make sure your background is organized, cleaned up, looking professional. That's, I, I many times I, I, I've seen people and they don't realize that I can see everything behind on your wall or on your shelves. And some of those things you might not want people to see, so... On the converse side of that is the people that have, that are kind of tech savvy and have figured out the way to do the pseudo green screen. And I know that there's a relatively easy way to implement that. Um, And actually there's some, for those crafty people, you can make your background whatever you want. I highly recommend the however, if you have that choice, to choose a background that's not too busy that's not too distracting. I was recently on a Zoom conference meeting where six out of the 12 uh, boxes had Muppet-themed backgrounds, and it was very busy, very busy, kind of a little overwhelming on the eyes. So keep that in mind as well when you're uh, coming up with those awesome virtual backgrounds, maybe something a little bit more subtle. Well, I usually have a background where I'm sitting on the bridge of the Enterprise. I'm sitting in the captain's chair, and around me is like, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> they do have that I wish one, I could have one like that. that they do have that. I would love oh, that. Yeah. That'd be cool. <laughs> I would love to get that one. I'll have to look into that. Um, one other thing, those of you out there who are doing this or, or are considering doing this, I would highly recommend, this is almost a requirement. I, it is a requirement, really. Record all of your lessons. Keep a library of, of all your one-on-one lessons. For reference, maybe your administration wants to check up on you and say, hey, are you really doing lessons? Oh, here's my library, check them out. And for protection as well, just in case of any, 
anything unfortunate that might be uh, thrown your way. You have protection if you've got these recordings to show that everything is as it should be. Everything is on the up and up, as they say. Absolutely. Correct. You also might want to think about coming up with a instructional video or maybe a one sheet for your students on some basic expectations that that you have for them when they're online in either a virtual lesson or a uh, classroom type situation just some expectations if you're doing like an instrumental one-on-one -on -one, you know you need, there needs to be a way for the student to obviously you know be heard and for them to have if they have a microphone that is better and then depending on the instrument how far away they're sitting from that microphone can really make a difference in what you're going to be hearing because you know it's it's already going to be hard enough in a virtual setting if you have a really poor quality audio coming at you then it's going to be you know unless you're just talking fingering errors which you want to talk you know, obviously you want to talk about those things but you want to talk about more than that and that's going to be it's going to be the necessity then for you to have a some sort of microphone set up or, or have you ha hopefully have the students have a microphone set up. I know a lot of schools have smart music and with smart music they have those microphones. Those work great. Those are set up specifically for instruments. The one microphone that is not set up specifically for instruments, that's going to be your laptop mic. Your laptop mic, that's going to be specifically set up for voices. So an instrument that sounds like a voice might work great but anything else might not work might not work as well. i also want to remind everybody out there that like i said my first thing i said a few minutes ago don't be scared even if you just have an iphone and you're using facetime or something like wechat or whatsapp or whatever anything like you know something similar if that's all you got then that's all you got and that will still work so don't be, don't, don't feel like, oh, I don't have all this high tech. I don't have this. I don't have that. So what? If you've got an iPhone, you can do FaceTime. It works. So don't be shy about that. Yeah, I think many school districts obviously have adopted different programs for you to do your online teaching. My district has chosen Google, Google Meets um, for our lessons, and it works great. It gives me the ability to record the screen. gives me the ability to share my screen if I need to. So, yeah, it, it, it's amazing how far the technology is coming. Speaking about technology and how far it's coming, one of the things that we're seeing a ton of these days, John, are those virtual concert videos. They're not really virtual Absolutely. concerts, though, are they? They're more like virtual performances. And you might have done one of these. You might be thinking about doing one. Uh, you might be dreading well, having to do one. You might be scared to death of doing That's one. That's right. You might you be know? scared you to do it. one. Yeah. There's going to be a variety of things, um, a variety of approaches to this whole thing. I know for sure you're feeling pressured to do it if you haven't done it. That's going to be, you've heard from somebody that, oh, you have. You, oh, look at this uh, school. Look at what they've done. You, have you thought about doing that? That's the old passive-aggressive get on it, man. So it's going to be tough. There are ways that I think you can possibly avoid doing it because, remember, we didn't go to school to become audio and video editors, right? We're music educators. I understand. Nobody signed up for this part of the job. But it's kind of become part of the job right now, huh, John? Even before this whole isolation thing and being stuck at home, you know, doing everything on your computer screen, even before that, and in the near future as we get back to normal, my point being is, yes, we're music educators, but in the 21st century, I think a skill like understanding and being able to do some kind of audio editing I think it's an essential skill for today's music educator. I really do. There are so many moments in your job where having that skill can be very convenient and valuable to have. Same with video editing. And I'll admit, even for me, I barely know a thing about video editing. I haven't really had to do it yet. But if I were to, if it were necessary, I wouldn't be opposed to learning it. I don't think the learning curve is too steep, and I think any reasonably intelligent person can do it. But audio editing for a music educator... 
I think that's a must. And here's the good news. Let's say you do want to do a virtual concert or a virtual performance with your group, with your students. It's not really that hard. And it won't cost you anything as far as having to invest in costly software. Yes, there's expensive versions of, of audio editing software out there that can cost upwards of $1,000 or more. And there's also great free versions on the, on the internet as well. So again, you can get into this if you're interested or thinking about it. You can get into it and do it well without having to spend a penny. And for those of you out there that are just shaking your head saying, no, 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 there is still a way for you to do it. And this is to get a third party involved. Um, either maybe you've got a, a department at your school, like an audio video department that can really help you with this. Or maybe one of I your know, staff members. I know maybe that one of your staff members might be studio savvy and can or handle one of your the students. Very easily. Yeah, you never know. That's could, possible to outsource this to them. They might be very willing and able. Um, but I also know that I've seen some Facebook groups where people have um, express, you know, offered their services for a price um, to do this because it is time consuming. While John says it's not that let's hard. Be, yes, I. It, it, let's be realistic. It, let's yes. be real. There's a there's a learning curve to doing it, and then there's also the time that it takes to actually do it. So, yes, while the actual uh, assembly, uh, you know, putting together the, the entire product might not be technically hard, it is time consuming, and it and if you've never done it before, there it's a pretty steep learning curve, but. That being said, there are lots of great YouTube videos on how to use Audacity. And John and I are going to walk you through how you might do this on your own. Um, if if you're thinking about doing a it real and quick you want to do it. A real quick yeah, overview absolutely. Of, of, the necess- of the necessary components and procedures, okay? You know, let's just talk about, real quick, John, about what you, what it is you're doing. You're not performing a virtual concert in other words your students aren't all getting online at the same time you're hitting record and recording something that is that's not vir- going to be virtually impossible unless everybody has lightning good. fast fiber uh, optic be, you know yeah, connections yeah. which you don't okay that is not what you're seeing online what you're seeing online is a recording basically with a video kind of on top of that recording and the directors are spending a lot of time uh, taking the video recording, right, with the audio and the video. This is basically a forty, tr- a forty-track, multi-track. Rec- you know, you got forty tracks from all your individuals that you have to sync and mix together. That's what you're really doing. You're taking all of your students' individual recordings and combining them. Think of them as separate processes. So first, you're going to strip the audio from the video, and then you're going to spend a majority of your time syncing those audio files and really getting your blend and balance and making sure the timing is correct. We got to back up and say, in order to accomplish all of this, you're going to need two pieces of software, which you have to be able to put on your computer. One being an audio editing piece of software. And then there's number, there's many, many versions out there. Go for a free one. If it's just something you're starting into, we both use Mark and I both use one called audacity. Are, are we uh, sponsors for Audacity? No. We both just use it. It's free. It's easy to use. It does a great job for what, what you're going to be doing. You're going to need video editing software as well. Uh, I don't know that as well as Mark does, but I do know there are free versions out there that can get the job done. So once you have both of those on your computer, now you get to work. You have to make a video recording of yourself conducting the song, with either a metronome in the background or a quick playing from some of your music software, maybe, and just just isolating the, the metronome part only and recording that on video. Now, choosing a song to do this with, if you've never done it before, we both highly recommend that you do something that involves one tempo only, such as a march. Okay, so Vesuvius. So, yeah, st- I would avoid, at least for a beginning... Vesuvius and or Beethoven's Ninth, maybe? <laughs> oh, yeah, those are easy. One tempo, no problem. <laughs> Vesuvius. <laughs> Great Frank Tichelli no? piece. Maybe not the best choice for a starting song. Oh, <laughs> that was good. 
No, I'd pick a March. Okay, so maybe maybe, <laughs> maybe I think something like a March, something that doesn't have too many tempo variations. Obviously, I think it's gonna it's gonna help you in the long run with your editing. Yeah, if it has one tempo, that's even better, and that's why John and I are advocating well, that way. A, March. If you... a lot of a lot of schools have done their alma mater, and I think that works great yeah. too. A lot of alma maters are one tempo. But if you're doing a march, and you, let's say you're not even, you don't even have something like Sibelius, you're just playing a recording of the march, and you got a, and you've got a Doctor Beat. Okay, so all you basically have to do is play the Doctor Beat at one twenty, and record yourself conducting at one twenty with that Doctor Beat all the time. That becomes the student's quote unquote click track. That's enough. That's right there. You can record yourself with That's the right. Doctor Beat at one twenty, record it for two or three minutes, and send it to them. Everybody now is working off the same tempo when they make their individual recordings. So now the next step is getting your students to make individual recordings of their particular part. So you're going to get 30, 40, 50, 70, however many players are in your band. For the wind players, not a big deal. They can record themselves playing. For the drums, that's another thing. What are you going to do about bass drum and snare drum and cymbals? Mark, Mark, you got a great solution Go for it. I think everyone's, I don't know that everyone, but I know a lot of people have seen the Jimmy Fallon and the Roots and how the Roots have been doing all their classics at home with makeshift percussion instruments, trash cans, boxes, tabletops, pots and pans. So I think this is a great opportunity for your percussionist to be creative, think outside the box. Big plastic outside garbage cans are a great bass drum. A yeah. couple of them could be timpani. Absolutely. Can, any of those types of ideas are great. So let them be creative. So now you've got all and of these. Let, go let ahead, them have Mark. fun with it. I just said let them have fun with it. Hey, yeah. Absolutely. And then that will make your video more fun also. So now you've got all of the individual tracks. Every student has recorded their individual part, and they've sent it to you. Now your email is all stuffed with a bunch or whatever, however they sent it to you. But you've now got all these tracks, and what are you going to do with them? You want to make sure that the students making the recordings are, again, giving you their best possible sound. So this might mean that they have to back up from that microphone, especially if they're a louder instrument like a trumpet or a trombone, and they might need to get a little bit closer to the to the microphone if they're a quieter instrument like a clarinet or a bassoon. I think it's imperative that you tell the students to that this shouldn't be their first take. In other words, they should have tried it once or twice and really, you know, given you the best you know, at least do a test recording to make sure that what they're sending you is the best possible sound that they can give you. And then once you have everybody's individual sounds, let's say you've got a band of 40, now you're going to have 40 video recordings and you're going to want to separate the video and the audio. Just go on to uh, Google and search extract MP3 from MP4 or video and you will see that there are a ton of free programs that will do that for you. I have a great little program called OSEN Audio, O-C-E-N Audio, and it's a free download. It's a, it's a really simple little program. You can record in it, but that's not what I use it for. I actually have used it for separating audio. I can put a little video in there, and then I can extract the MP3 right out of it and save it as an MP3. Boom, done. And it's a really easy little program. Like I said, it's free online, O-C-E-N audio. Uh, just do a search for it. And there are others out there. I'm not, again, I'm not endorsing that particular one. I just happen to use it, and I know it does the job. So, but there are others as well. So you're going to want to do that for all of your different videos so that you're working in a program like Audacity or another DAW. DAW, D-A-W, Digital Audio Workstation. That's a Digital DAW. Digital Audio Workstation. This could be... Uh, Pro Tools is a very popular one, probably the, the industry standard uh, Pro Tools or Logic Pro There's also a Pro free version X. of Pro Tools. You That's can find right. a free version of it now, and you get it right from the source, authorized, everything. So that's also free. Garage Band, free. Audacity. There's Garage there Band. Are, yeah, there's yep, many. Many, many, many. So you pick the one that's right for you, and you'll want to obviously sync up these tracks. Hopefully you've got a great starting point for each student and that they've maintained their relative tempo to the click track that the, you've given them. 
and you want to blend and balance that sound. One of the things here that you want to do and keep in mind is that you want to have the best polished sound because now you're really what you what you are as a producer and you want to have the best quality sound and engineer that you can get. combined you're and engineer, be turning that's the knobs right. and and uh, and affecting the overall sound now don't be afraid to add reverb don't be afraid to <laughs> pitch correct play, play with the eq a little bit pitch correct that's right all of those don't, features yeah. are available in audacity they're all Absolutely. things that are available. And another thing that you can do is let's say that one of your students has a really rough performance. Well, that student can be uh, still featured in the video, but no one will ever know if you mute that entire track. Or if you've got 200 wind players, if you've got a huge band, you take the best 60 your top chair players and make sure that each chair is covered properly. First clarinet, second clarinet, third clarinet, whatever it might be. But you don't have to always use every single person all the time. All right. You have that choice. You can mix a part out, an individual part out, you know, just have their level at zero for a, a portion of the song and then bring it back up to a balance level. You can do all of those things. So don't feel like you have to use all of the audio tracks. Use what you need for the best possible sound. And just remember, just like you're telling your students how you want to have a great pyramid of sound with a lot of nice low end, you want to have the same thing in your mix. So don't be afraid to bump up your tubas and to bring down your piccolos because those piccolos are going to cut through in that frequency and your tuba is not. And so go ahead, you know, if you need to double, triple, quadruple that tuba part, there's different ways that you can do that. Basically, just turn the volume up, right? Make sure that you've got a, right. a really great All of these mix. programs will have a mixing board, a virtual mixing board, and you can just balance each one of those tracks as you need to. And that's ultimately how you get that sound that you want. Use that mixing board, a little bit of EQ when you want to on some of the parts. It's fun. It gets to be fun after all. You're the master of your domain, right. and you're be able to you're able to do these things that sometimes you can't even do in the classroom because you can't get that student to just play as soft as you might want them to or as loud as you might want them to. Now you can. Now you can control it just as as much as you want. Let's say you have a a really important marimba part, and none of your students have taken home a marimba and. We don't have access to recording a marimba. Well, don't be afraid to go into Sibelius and write a marimba part and put, put that part in there if it's really essential. Mixed in and blended in with the, the real instruments, uh, it's going to be very hard for anyone to tell the difference. And the other alternative is many times your mallet players might also have piano experience. Don't be afraid to say, hey, just record on piano at home. If you have a piano at home, record the rim apart on piano. And just yep. give, us, give us that recording, okay? That goes back to that similar idea of what we were talking about with percussion. We're not using real percussion instruments, but you're giving us that percussion of rhythm still on a new, with a new, new unique sound. Use a piano for your keyboard parts. If, if a keyboard part is necessary and they have a piano, just do that. And just kind of coming back to what we talked about before, we understand if if there's directors out there that just don't want to do it. And we understand teaching balance and blend ensemble sound, how to match, tuning, all these things. These are the things that, that we live and breathe for. We're going to get back there. I promise we will get back to teaching our students. It's in already person, happening. In ensembles. Happening. We will have concerts again. These are... This is not going to be forever. We're not going to have to produce virtual concerts for the rest of our careers. We're going to get back to the concert hall. And and it's okay. It's okay. Whatever you're doing right now, you know, you've got enough on your plate, right? Like we keep saying, we know how busy you are. Well, we, we do know how busy you are, and we know that maybe this might be one thing too many. And let's be real. Once you know, once this is all over, you might not ever have to do it again. And good riddance to it. But this might become part of the way we teach. This might become a part of the way music education is from here moving forward. 
And I think we need to embrace it because there are some, there's going to be some really great things that come out of this time. But again, I have a lot of empathy for the director that's just has, you know, just shaking their head right now because I get it. I totally understand. This is I not the way, it, this is not what anyone bargained for. But again, don't be too dismayed. It is it is getting back to normal. And I can speak from personal experience because I am now back in classroom teaching, not with large groups, ensembles, not yet over here, but I am doing one-on-one -on -one lessons now at my college again. I teach bass guitar over here. That's my other main job. And uh, so I'm already back into the college doing that. And entry into the college is a bit restricted. You have to have your teacher badge and they take your temperature. But once you're in college and teaching one-on-one, -on -one, it's just pretty much back to normal again. We're talking about getting ensembles back up and running in September over here, as long as things don't take a turn for the worse, which we, of course, hope that doesn't happen. But so far, we're looking at maybe getting back into some normal ensembles in the fall over here. That's, that is the plan, at least. Okay, we'll see how it goes. But yes, I'm already doing classroom teaching. One thing I do know right now is that there are some best practices that are being developed. So we can't look to any of those best practices and say, oh, everyone should be doing X, Y, and Z. Because really, we're, everybody's so new at this that X, Y, and Z could change on a regular basis. And I've seen some really awesome developments in the virtual front um, for education in general and for music education. And so going forward, we'll start to see what those best practices were, and it'll be a lot easier. You'll start having, you know, imagine having a professional development day on how to have a virtual concert, right? Wouldn't that be awesome? And that might be something where if, if an administrator is really hounding you uh, to do it and you're just not comfortable to do it, you might say, you know, hey, I, I don't have the resources, I don't have the training, I don't have the knowledge, and and point to those things. But again, like John was saying, uh, a lot of free applications out there, a lot of great uh, tutorials on YouTube. So check that kind of stuff out. Oh, bah! Oh, bah! It hurts. It hurts every time. Yeah, I just I just look at it as uh, it's just going to be on the profit loss sheet. Okay, I mean, it's just another set of dishes or another dish, and uh, it's just part of our operating expenses. It happens. I'll always take a broken dish because that tells me we got customers. If there's no customers, there's nothing to be broken. You know what I That's mean? That's right. That's right. Broken dishes, at least we don't have any broken hearts that I'm yeah, aware that of. That be a really cool jazz song, like a, like a bluesy... Broken dishes, broken, broken, broken hearts. hearts. Broken dishes, it could be a cool, could be a cool little big bandy swing thing. I think I that might be something I want to write. Anyways, it's dessert time. Our desserts are always so cool. I love desserts here. Iconic ice cream. This is going to be all about our icons, our high school band directors. And we should name them first. My high school band director was Mr. Gary L. Wampler. And yes, I know what the L stands for. I don't actually. Even though I've known Gary for so long, I don't know what L stands for. You can tell me whenever you want to. But my band director's name was Mr. Don Nelson. And I don't recall him having a middle initial. At least I never knew of it. We always knew it. And we, his nickname was Doc. We called him Doc. After Doc Severinsen. Just a man of all trades. We, that was his nickname. We never called him Mr. Nelson. We called him Doc. Well, what years did you go to high school, John? I started in 1973. I God, I almost regret even mentioning that. It's all right. It's like, oh, am I that 1973? old? 1973. 1973. Graduated 1977. Quite a quite a time in our nation's history. I went to school from 1994 to 1998. So, how about that? 
20 years apart. Well, that's a very, it's also a momentous time. You watched the birth of the internet, at least the public birth of it. It had been around for a while, but it started to become a public thing, AOL, things like that. That all happened while you were in high school. For me, into the Vietnam War, Nixon resigning. Yeah, pretty uh, turbulent times. What else? The, Jeez. Right, right. So right. tell me, John, first, about... The first Arab oil embargo. Yes, go ahead. Tell me about your high school marching band experience. Well, this is... You know, it's interesting. We were just talking about this a while ago. We've had a lot of parallels in our career, but what we don't have parallel in is our high school experience. My high school band experience and yours are vastly different, not any less significant or valuable, just vastly different. My high school marching band experience, really, for the four years I was in high school, was the traditional old college-style marching band, squads of four, a different halftime show every week. In those days, you still went to away games, and you would do a smaller but still a field show, even at an away game, most of the time. And then you do longer, since you were the home team, you get to do a longer halftime show as the home team. And yeah, every week during the fall season, we would do a different show. And that was, we didn't think anything of it. That was the norm. We learned new music. And you didn't have to memorize it. You carried your flip folders and you carried them on the field and you just read off the flip folder. But our marching band season, we, did, we didn't do any competitions. We did a few parades. Local San Jose parades, things like that. I grew up in Mountain View, home of Google now. And, um, but for me, it was, marching band was just one part of the school year because we also had a daily jazz band class. Uh, my senior year, I was in choir as well. We had a very active theater department, so we had a very comprehensive spring musical program. So for us, the competition aspect didn't exist. We had a very well-rounded type of, band experience from wind ensemble and uh, a jazz band like I'd mentioned from the spring musicals and the other thing one of the things that I cherish most about my years there is that my high school band director bless his heart he never told me no he always encouraged me to learn something new all the time freshman year I was playing baritone sax in, in the marching band and I played bass in the jazz band and I played baritone in the wind band so three different instruments my sophomore year, I was playing drums, and I played tuba, and then I played, you know, different things all the time. He's also the person that discovered that I had perfect pitch. He was the one who really figured it out once and for all and sat me down my freshman year one day after school. I was there for almost an hour. He did a whole bunch of tests on single notes, basic chord structures, more advanced chord structures, the whole idea. Um, had, me li had me listen to a piece of music and say, write down the melody. You know, just the whole thing. And that was then he sat me down and said, you have something called perfect pitch. And he explained what it was and the positives and negatives of, of it. So great band director, great, great band director. He was never the competitive kind of person. He always liked to expose his students to new and different things, different instruments, all different kinds of music, that kind of thing. Sounds like a really cool guy. He was. He was. He, on an annual basis, by my last couple of years in high school, he would take me with him up to San Francisco on a summer afternoon, like in July or August, to the annual trip, annual trek up to Byron Hoyt Sheet Music Service. Remember, in those days, the 70s, he didn't have the internet. You wanted to buy new music, you had to go to a sheet music shop. Byron Hoyt was the best in the Bay Area in Northern California at the time. And they had their area for band or for concert band and new marching band songs and new jazz band songs. So he would go up there and spend a day um, just scouring through all the different things and picking out what we thought looked good. He would let me choose a few things, which I thought was incredible. I'm 16 years old and here I am picking new music for our high school band. And he would take me out to lunch. He, he knew a great deli nearby the sheet music place and we'd have sandwiches and just sit and talk. How often do you get to do that with your band director? Just an incredible moment for me as a teenager. You know, actually, I had a very similar experience with uh, Mr. Wampler, as many people lovingly call him Womp, or sometimes Womp. Swamp. But, uh, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Wampler, his favorite Mexican food restaurant was Don Jose's in Huntington Beach, just a five-minute ride from Fountain Valley High School, and... 
he took me a couple of times, um, I believe his drum major, to, I remember he loved his chili rellenos, and uh, that was his go-to spot. You know, I think I went there with you on one of those times. Yeah, it was a, it was one of his favorite spots, so it doesn't surprise me. Gary Wampler, anyone in the Southern California area probably has heard of this legend. Uh, he was a man that did it all, uh, starting in the in the early 80s. He took over the program. He stayed there for, gosh, was it 34 years, John? 32, 32 years. 34, 34 years. 32 gosh. years. 81, 81 to 2013. So basically just like David, Letterman, just an amazing career. Years. And the man is known for his, his energy, his just his passion. And I'll never forget some of the best lessons I ever took for him, took from him was watching him talk to administrators, boosters, principals, the custodial staff, super superintendents. He would fight for the, for the students, he would always put the students first. I remember him saying, it's for the students, it's for the kids. And he always put the kids first. It was really amazing. Uh, and he did it all, like I said, from jazz band, to orchestra, to teaching piano class, teaching music theory. He, uh, he managed to build a legendary program. Gary Wampler, you know, one of my favorite memories from high school was uh, obviously if we've talked about our championships uh, at the Santa Clara Vanguard, but Gary also marched in the 1972 Kingsman. He was a snare drummer in that very famous line along with Ralph Hardman and Tom Float and many others that are legends. The first DCI champions. First ever DCI champions in, I believe it was Whitewater, Wisconsin, John? Whitewater, Wisconsin. That's correct. He come. He came out of that line, and I, you know, we talked about, you know, me looking at your championship ring, and also looking at our other instructor, who had marched 1989 Vanguard, his championship ring, and, you know, of course, we'd always ask Gary, like, hey, Gary, where's your championship ring? And he would always say, oh, they didn't give rings out in 1972, and, you know, that was his go-to line. Oh, when I marched, they didn't give out rings. That is true. The first year, just a note of a trivia note. The first year they did that was 1979. Uh -huh. That was the first year of champion rings. So as a senior, I decided I wanted to design a ring and present it to him at the end of the year as a senior present. So I remember I got a, you know, a Jostin's catalog, and I you actually borrowed my I ring. Traced, you borrowed my ring as well. I kind traced of out this as a, ring as a, as a kind of design. That's idea. right, and I put the Kingsman logo on it. 1972 DCI Champions, the DCI logo, and a big beautiful blue stone on top because that was the uh, Kingsman's colors. And we presented him the ring, and you know, I think that is one of Gary's most favorite pieces of jewelry because he wears it often. He wears it with pride. He loves it. He loves telling the story and he, uh, about the 1972 Kingsman line, and that ring is just something that he gets to hold up. And he also holds it up in, in front of guys like Tom Flo and Ralph Hardiman, and they're like, hey, where's mine? <laughs> so <laughs> it's a point of pride for him. I can see Ralph saying that too. Yo, where's mine? Yo, man. <laughs> Give me one of those. Yeah, totally. Ralph, he might have one by now. I love Ralph. Absolutely. Probably. But yeah, Gary Wampler and his energy, man. Um, and you got a chance because, of course, you were my assistant band director, so you worked under Gary Wampler for a year. What was it like working under Gary? Because uh, I know what it was like working under Gary. What was it like for you? Well, Gary... Gary was such an easy person to work with and and work for. Uh, yeah, he put duties upon me. Uh, finding ha finally having an assistant director around him, he could put duties upon me, and he could say, "Yeah, you take care of this. I'm going home." <laughs> right. But that's okay. That's what the job of an assistant is for. Um, but Gary also gave me so much freedom to learn from. It's ironic that one of the things you mentioned a few minutes ago about Gary is that, you know, he, you talk about Gary's priority, about kids always being first, the kids always being first. You know, I also learned that from Gary as well. It's not that I didn't believe in that before, but Gary's passion for that concept really 
it really sunk into me. And to, to this day over here, even with my kids in Shenzhen, the Xili Band, which you know well of, Mark, my, my central focus on everything I do down there and all the teachers understand it down there and they, they follow the same ideas now. It's all about the kids. Whatever we do, however we do it, however we teach it, whatever it might be, it's all about the kids. Got to make sure it's all about the kids. And I learned that from Gary like you did. So yeah, working for Gary was a true honor. And for him to give me the freedom to be an assistant director and to do a lot of things, to to have success and to learn from mistakes as well. He was really great about all of that. So even though I had been a successful educator before that, Gary still was very much a mentor for me too. Taking over for uh, the previous assistant band director, Gary had looked to me and said, you know, I really want to pass the baton on to you. And so he not only gave me a lot of those, you know, responsibilities and and things like you, John, but he also took the time to really make sure that I understood the core concepts that I, you know, many times he would say, Mark, when I'm gone, you've got to do it like this. When I'm gone, you've got to do it like this. And I understood uh, every time he would take the time to say it, that it was something that, you know, he's not just checking off a box, but he's making sure that his legacy stayed intact and make sure that the band stayed healthy. So that's something I really look, I really uh, looked up to and really appreciated. And I, that mentorship, um, you know, I, I look at that and I, and I try to emulate it in some way, shape or form through the, through the small amount of mentoring that I can do. But um, yeah, he's uh, he's he's awesome. I have one f- more funny story from about Gary Wampler, and that is from my r- freshman year in high school, um, 1994. Gary Wampler was known for wearing a uh, white tuxedo coat in the 80s and early 90s for his m- major band competitions. So if you see Gary p- Gary Wampler pictures from the from the 80s, early 90s, you'll see this beautiful white tuxedo. And I'll never forget, we were coming on to a field show, I think it was uh, Savannah, one of the shows at the famous Glover Stadium in La Palma, near Anaheim. The announcer was must have been someone he knew. I think it was either John Hawsey, it might have been Ryan Turner. But as we're walking on the field, the announcer says, you know, Fountain Valley, you may enter the field. And as soon as Gary gets to the 50-yard line, the announcer says, uh, Paige and Gary Wampler, we'd like a table for two. A table for two, please. And the audience just <laughs> erupted. And I think we had someone had to zoom in on Gary, and he's looking, looking up at the box and laughing and pointing. But not soon after that, the uh, he retired that white jacket. I think he... Uh, well, he retired that white jacket the year I got there because when I first met Gary the year before in 96, when he asked me to come on board, do the music, that whole thing, he was still wearing that white jacket. That was at Tournament of Champions in 1996, and that's how I first met him. My first conversation ever with Gary Direct, he was still wearing that jacket. But we broke him of that habit in 1997. Yep. The Waterworld year in that picture is the first first picture in his career that he's not wearing that white jacket i think except for his maybe first or second uh band picture but he has a whole lot of years in there where he's got that awesome white jacket and it matched the band for a long time because for a long time the band was wearing kind of a tuxedo looking had ruffles bright blue and gold pinning down the stride down the side big bright orange plumes (laughs) i mean yeah man it was the 80s it was an awesome time. It was the 80s. Oh, yeah. Now, Gary, I tell you, I feel so fortunate in my career to have my early mentor in Mr. Nelson, who met much of my teaching style, as I realize it nowadays, comes from him, just how he spoke to the band and his conducting style and all of those little things. I emulate that without even realizing it. But then I had a second mentor, people like Gary Wampler. And people like Charles Gray, and that's another conversation another time. But to have other mentors like that, even mid-career, to to really 
help me become the educator I am today. And I'm sure that we've got a lot of music educators out there that are thinking back to their high school band directors right now and what kind of impact they made. And understand, ladies and gentlemen, that's the kind of impact you're making right now on hundreds, if not thousands of students. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep up the good fight. Uh, there's there's no better job, in my, in my opinion, than teaching music. So... You've got the right career. Sometimes I know that this job can get you down, but uh, hopefully you realize that there's a whole community of us out here, and when you fall down, we uh, will do everything we can to pick you back up. At least, if nothing else, we've got a good meal for you here at the Bistro all the time. Speaking of that, I'm I'm getting brain freeze, Mark. This iconic ice cream is... It's brain settled into the freeze. brain. I, I'm, I think we're, we're done. We're done, we're man. We're done. Brain hey, freeze. ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for stopping by the Bistro today. We know just how busy you are. Again, my name's Mark. And I'm John. And this has been the Band Director's Bistro. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. See ya. Educators on the go. This is the band director's bistro.